Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. I am pleased to share that we are joined by a legend of British chess this week. He's been an elite chess player for the last 30 or so years. He's a former world championship finalist, the seven-time champion of Great Britain, who's been ranked as highly as number four in the world with a peak ELO of 2761. He is also an author, the co-author of the very original instructive new book, Think Like a Super Grandmaster, along with Philip Hurtado. He's won too many tournaments to name, so we will leave the introduction to the, to that and welcome him to the show. Welcome Grandmaster Mickey Adams. Hi, Ben. Nice to be here. Thanks. I'm so excited to speak with you, Mickey. I'm a longtime fan of your chess and your comportment, so it's it's a big honor, and I've got, got lots of questions to dig into. Great. Thank you for having me. Sure. So I thought we would talk about your chess for starters, Mickey, believe it or not. I know that you've got this tournament coming up in Sweden next month, which will be about a week away by the time this interview comes out. And I was curious, I know you're always an active player. Um, you you play a lot of tournaments per year, but obviously with the pandemic, that slowed down a bit. And I know you did play a couple OTB tournaments last year, but I'm curious, like as you start to dust the cobwebs off, you know, um, how you approach it uh, these days. Um, yeah, with a certain amount of trepidation, I think <laughs> is the answer to that. Uh, it's sort of a big change, really, because I've been a professional player since I was 17. And of course, I'm, I was always playing a lot. And then the pandemic and for various reasons, online stuff wasn't really for me. So I didn't really do very much of that. I played a couple of online events, but not a huge amount. Um, I, I mean, I played a few tournaments, but some just weren't practical. So I'm really hoping this year to, and I've got three, at least three events, perhaps four and lined up over the next four months. And we'll see where we are then, I think. But uh, you definitely lose sharpness when you're not playing. You're just not reviewing openings and going over things. And also, I, I think I had a period where I didn't study a lot. I was doing other things. And then suddenly you come back and you find that, you know, there are all these huge number of games played online and some of them are actually quite important in terms of theory. So there's there's quite a lot to do. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. And it's uh, there'll be quite a lot of young guys in uh, Malmo who uh, I've never played with before. Uh, so that will be an interesting challenge. So it's, I think it's going to be pretty tough times in general because... I'm 50 now. I'm playing guys half or a third of my age. And I think the break definitely didn't help me. And it definitely helped a lot of younger players a lot. So I think it will be a big challenge to try and come back and uh, play well. But I, I hope to try and be much more active in playing and uh, let other chess activities take a backseat over the uh, upcoming year at least. Well, we will be excited to see that. And the TP Sigmund tournament will feature Jordan Van Forest, David Navarra, Alexei Shirov, Saleh Salem, uh, Aryan Uragasi, who of course won Tata Steel Challengers in convincing fashion, Niels Grindelius, and Hans Niemann. Um, is there, uh, so amongst that group, Mickey, is there anyone whose chess has, has particularly struck you as you start to sort of, uh, I am imagining, look at these players' games? Um, yeah. Um, I suppose, uh, I suppose that the younger players that I don't know so much about that, uh, I've, I've only really, really started seeing their games perhaps over the last few months. Uh, whereas obviously, uh, you know, someone like Shirov, I've seen his games at a very <laughs> similar age. So we've yeah. seen each other's games for, uh, several decades. So, uh, it's, a, it's a completely different amount of information, uh, and uh, different challenges, but yeah, it's a challenge for both both sides. If you've never played someone before, it's going to be new new for them as well. Uh, 
And when you play these young guns, do you like at the club level, you know, and even Grandmaster Ben Feingold has talked about this concept of old man chess, basically try to play positionally, which obviously you're known for anyway. Um, when you play younger players, do you make any stylistic adjustments when you're playing these these young sharks, Mickey? No, not really. I, I've got my own plan and that's that's what I stick to, really. So I don't think I make huge adjustments. Um, but perhaps sometimes if you play younger players, there might be, there may be some more opportunities uh, in terms of there may be some things they're less experienced with that uh, players who have been playing for a longer time. Uh, so there may be some kind of openings you can take them where you're a bit more comfortable, but it just depends on the player. And it's quite different now. Just people know so much more at an earlier age that uh, the speed of learning is just huge compared to what it used to be. It's a completely different uh, ball game to what it used to be. That makes sense. And three weeks from the tournament, as we re record this, um, do you start to think about what you're going to play against certain players? I mean, you probably don't know colors yet, but just out of curiosity... Um, I think in this case, I probably will try and have a bit of a plan. Uh, I've thought about it a little bit, but I haven't really had much time so far. So I will be trying to uh, certainly think about things. And yeah, I might try and make a, a plan in this case. I think when you know the opponent some time in advance, then, then you probably got some kind of plan. But obviously, colours are quite important. And uh, yeah, you have to... Uh, if you get a different color, that plans out the window. Yeah. And you don't have to reveal your prep here. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's not that much to reveal yet. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, and Mickey, you mentioned you've got a few other tournaments already on the docket. What else uh, is scheduled for 2022? Um, well, uh, I'm not quite sure if I'm supposed to reveal everything yet, but uh, I'm certainly hoping to be playing at the Olympia. And I think as far as I know, all, everything's going well with that. Possibly the British Championship, although that is very soon after the uh, after the Olympiad. And there's another event I don't know if I should mention just yet. Okay. Yeah, the Olympiad was the main one I wanted to ask you about. I mean, of course, as I mentioned to you before we're recording, I've been reading your dad's sort of memoirs of your early chess years. And it's a lot of fun to uh, to, to relive your ascent. And is it is it correct that you've played every Olympiad since 1990 or something? Uh, for England, uh, I believe that's right. I think the first one, uh, the first one I think was in, uh, Novi Sad in 1990. I think that's right. And, uh, yeah, I have played all the, uh, all the ones subsequently. And which one, uh, do you regard the fondest as you look back? Uh, it's very hard to pick one out of, uh, all of them. Um, and yeah, there's sort of, Sometimes places were really great and the chess didn't go very well. Uh, I think the one in Manila was a very, really nice Olympiad. It was great fun, but the team did pretty awfully. And sometimes you can be uh, in a, quite a lousy place. The one in, uh, I think, Moscow in 94, the hotel and stuff, things were very tough. But we actually had a very good run with the team at one stage, which was uh, quite a lot of uh, fun. Uh, more recently, we had quite a good run uh, I think at the uh, the uh, last Olympiad. So it's just just depends, and uh, different things uh, are enjoyable in different competitions. And it's uh, it's quite a lot of events now. Actually, it's a long time since I was playing in them. Yeah, and obviously we could look at the top players in UK and make some conjecture. But do do you know who else will be playing on the team? Um, I don't completely, but I would imagine the team will be pretty similar to the team we've had for. The, past few team competitions as, as far as as far as I know but I, I'm not actually involved in in that side of it uh, at all but I would expect I expect everyone will want to play but we'll we'll see how it uh, how it works out excellent uh, I, go ahead I, I would certainly yeah I would certainly hope that we have David Hell, Gawain Jones uh, Luke McShane and uh, possibly one or yeah, I don't know, uh, on the top four balls that we've had. Uh, I don't think Matthew Sadler will be coming out of retirement for it. So <laughs> it would be nice if he did. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how he does it. <laughs> no, I, I don't really know how he does all the things he does uh, as it is. Uh, I don't think he'll have the kind of holiday time to uh, 
head off to India for for that amount of uh, time. Well, maybe he can play in India and work his job at the same time and write a book, <laughs> <laughs> write another book, uh, uh, another uh, simul as he's he's renowned for while he's reviewing books for New and Chess and and the list goes on. Um, so, Mickey, one thing you're you're renowned for is obviously, as you mentioned, you recently turned fifty, and you're still you know you're still as strong as ever amongst the top players, you know, your peak ELO was achieved in your forties. And uh, that that's something that seems to be becoming increasingly rare. So do you, do you have any theories on how you've been able to maintain your chest strength? Um, not so much. I mean, when I got to sort of my late thirties, I was already a bit doubtful about how things would continue both in terms of keeping my own level and also just the sheer number of other strong players that were going to come along and sort of gradually knock, move me down the world rankings, even if I was maintaining my own level. And I was sort of thinking about it very much in a short-term kind of way and think, well, I'll try and keep on playing for a year, 18 months, two years. And if it keeps on going well, I'll just keep on going for another year. And that's really how it's gone. I've, I've been quite surprised Uh how well it's gone in some respects and some other players that I thought would carry on quite successfully seem to have have struggled more uh, in terms of maintaining their playing strength. I'm not entirely uh, sure why, but I haven't, I have carried on trying to work at it and to play as, as well as I can. Uh, and I guess that's part of it because I think some players at some stage, they start prioritizing other things uh, and they sort of accept that their level might drop as, as a consequence. Uh, you certainly have to sort of be quite committed to it, I think, if you want to maintain your strength. Uh, but I've been sort of quite positively uh, impressed by how well it's gone, actually. And is there anything in particular you attribute this uh, success too? Is it like, uh, is it chess work? Is it lifestyle work? Uh, do you have any, any guesses? Well, I suppose, I mean, I think it's a bit of both, I suppose, but I think you have to just be willing to keep on working and be open to new ideas, uh, to a reasonable extent. I don't think if you're 50, you're going to adapt to new ideas in the same way that someone will, who's, uh, who's just up and coming now, but I think you have to be a bit flexible in that regard. Um, And, uh, you know, I'm probably fitter now than I was when I was, you know, younger. So in that respect, perhaps that has helped, but I don't think that's a big factor because energy is sort of so much more of a a factor and that declines so much as you get older compared to when you're younger anyway. I think it's, uh, it's probably not not quite such a big factor as it's sometimes uh, suggested. Interesting. It is. You're, you're an outlier with that suggestion. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I've just, I, I think there's a, I think age is a, is a factor, which is a, you can't change that much with exercise is my impression. Interesting. And when you play, do you, how do you feel at the board? Do you feel as, as sharp as ever? Do you feel more blunder prone? Like how, does your, has your approach changed? In general, most of the time it's okay. Sometimes I just have very bad days. And somehow, even if you feel that it's going badly early in the game, it seems to be very hard to reverse it during that game, even if you're sort of aware things aren't going well that day. Um, But I guess that overall, my rating hasn't changed that much. So if uh, that was a massive problem, then presumably it would be showing in my results because I didn't feel that some years ago so I don't think I think I've changed very little in some ways Uh, I'm just uh, obviously you're looking at different openings different ideas things like that but in terms of the way I approach the game very little has changed I might be a bit more uh, practical in terms of preparation or uh, opening choices and things like that but uh, more tweaking things than making huge changes, I would say. Okay. And you mentioned that some players, uh, you were surprised that that they'd fallen off a bit. Obviously, we're not looking to to single anyone out, but some people have espoused the theory that part of the part of what might contribute to chess longevity is sort of a more positional style. And of course, you're known for sort of classical 
um, great chess understanding. Your friend Ali Mordazavi, who I interviewed, uh, it will come out the week before this interview, talked about how you just kind of have a natural sense of, of where the pieces go. Do, do you think that your chess style has contributed to your longevity, Mickey? Um, I'm not sure about that, uh, particularly now because people now defend so much better that often when you try and win positional games, it can take quite a long time now uh, and a lot of energy. It used to be a bit easier to win games in terms of the resistance you face. So some some tournaments end up having a lot of long games, which I think can be detrimental. I mean, it, I think everyone just plays to the style that suits them. Uh, we've seen uh, Shirov having a pretty good run yeah. recently. Uh, and as I mentioned, he's a similar age to me. Uh, so, And he wasn't exactly playing uh, <laughs> too quietly in all those games, let's say. So I think, it, but that's just his style. So I think everyone tends to stick with their own style and if you're still true to yourself and you're able to perform at the level that you were able to when you're younger, uh, then then I think you can be successful. I'm not sure the style is is so important. Uh, you know, we're probably you know for pretty much at the extremes in terms of styles, I would say. Right. And you know, a lot of other people are perhaps more in the uh, perhaps more in the middle. But I am quite ruthless. There are some things I just say, no, it's not for me. Some types of position, I will, I will just say this is not practically. I, I don't want to go there. Uh, and I think that is perhaps something you have to think more about when you're older. If you're not sure about something, maybe it's just time to say, okay, I'm not going there. Any any particular openings come to mind that are that are topical? It's not so much opening choices. It's it's more certain certain lines in the openings or certain variations. Or you'll see something the computer goes, "This is all right," and you're like, "It's it's all right, but it's not all right for me." You've okay. got to, You've got to. I think be quite uh, personalizing your own choices is quite an important part of chess. Uh, and sometimes I've I've done some work with people, and I think often people don't personalize their choices too much or you will sometimes ask them why they play a particular line and they they don't have a particularly uh, convincing answer, let's say, as to, as to why they're playing the line or they'll say, I've always played that line or, or I'll say it doesn't resuit really your style and they'll go, eh, probably not. <laughs> but uh, they haven't necessarily ta- taken an active decision to uh, see if there's another way to uh, resolve that problem. Okay. And you mentioned, of course, working with, with computers. Obviously, they've changed a ton over the course of your career. Uh, so how do you use them these days, Mikey? Well, I suppose probably similarly to most other people that, you know, you turn them on and they <laughs> give you these long lines, which are very confusing. Um, but uh, I, don't, I suppose, you know, similarly to most of the top players that, you know, you're always checking lines and uh, it becomes a bit uh, dispiriting in some ways when you use them because everything tends to uh, default to equality a lot uh, and that's clearly a problem so I think you do want to try and have as much as your own input as you can when you're uh, looking at a line and uh, perhaps to sometimes try and come up with your own ideas perhaps I think I often more look at games first and try and uh, glean something from the games that are played before uh, before I check an, an idea with the computer rather than going directly to what the computer says. I think uh, you're often guided by games that have been played or you try and, uh, or in uh, if you can, even come up with something original of your own. Oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. And then check the computer subsequently. And um, do you use... You know, obviously, everyone seems to use Stockfish. When I interviewed uh, Erwin Lamy, he mentioned renting Cloud Space, which I know a lot of top players are doing. And then there's uh, Leela Zero, obviously, available for free. Um, do you have a preferred engine approach? Um, well, I think most people are using Stockfish at the moment. I think that's pretty common. Uh, yeah, I'm not super great on very powerful computers or cloud computing and stuff like that. But I've got, a, you know... I'm not sure you need these super strong engines as much. Uh, you know, you can get very good results with a, a powerful computer and uh, uh, just uh, asking asking the the opinion there. 
sometimes uh, sometimes Leila can come up with some interesting ideas. But my impression is that as Stockfish has become stronger, I think they've perhaps tweaked the settings a bit, it, 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 that it's now incorporated more of uh, those ideas. And sometimes I might just turn on, sometimes if you're really struggling, you might just turn on a completely different engine and uh, see if that gives you uh, some ideas. Uh, but it, it sort of changes. I mean, at one time, uh, there was an engine called a Junior. I remember it, uh, sometime people go, turn on Crazy Junior, and it will give you a completely different uh, idea. Uh, but that's, you know, a long, long time ago. I don't think anyone uses uh, that engine anymore now yeah. because it's just not strong enough, but uh, it hasn't been updated in recent times as far as I know. Uh, but, yeah, you can always you can always get a different opinion, but uh, they uh, they tend to be pretty similar quite a lot of the time, I think, now. Okay. Well, Mickey, we've got some great uh, questions from supporters of the podcast uh, relating to sort of reflecting on your career that I want to dig into. But first, we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. You may have heard Grandmaster Mickey Adams mention the Chessable Best of British Chess Course. That is by Grandmaster Simon Williams, and I am Richard Palliser. In the video version, you have GM Simon Williams walking you through Uh, 16 hours worth of the best games ever by British players, often joined by legends like Mickey Adams, Nigel Short, Matthew Sadler, John Spielman, and the list goes on. And of course, whichever version you get, uh, you get chessable space repetition in order to make sure you remember the concepts that you learn. So that's one of the many things you can check out both for purchase and for free from our friends at chessable.com. So we are back, Mickey, and yeah, we've got some some great questions. Uh, this one is from Patreon supporter of the podcast, Deshaun Solomon. Thanks for supporting the pod, Deshaun. And of course, uh, supporters can send in questions for guests such as uh, our um, esteemed guest, Mickey Adams. So he asks you, who is the most naturally talented player you have ever played against? Yeah, I, I like that question. Um, well, it's difficult to name one person, um, but I would say when I was young, uh, Anand would come over and play a lot of the uh, events in England, uh, all the kind of England junior squad events. He, he would often play with the Commonwealth. Um, he's a bit older than me, but so I played quite a lot with him then and other tournaments like Oakham and Lloyds Bank Masters and things like that. And at that time, it was amazing to see him play because it would have been back in the days when it was 40 moves in two and a half hours with the Germans. It was uh, so long ago. Uh, but he would play so fast. I mean, it was completely common for him to finish the game maybe in 20 minutes, something like that. And not short games, just normal games. I mean, he was still playing incredibly well. I think he played a lot of blitz in India. So he was quite used to to uh, quick time limits and he would just play super fast. And I remember one game that I played with him uh, at the Lloyds Bank Masters. Uh, and he was actually late for the game. That was quite unusual for him. But I think he was walking through uh, Hyde Park to get to the game. But of course, when you go through parks in London, it can be a bit tricky. You can't find the exit because ex- right. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't that many exits. So he was making good progress and then he was a bit stuck. So he was about 20 minutes late. I mean, it made no difference, but he, it's not typical for him to be late, even though he didn't need the time. He's a polite chap. Um, and then we sort of played the game, but uh, somehow... Uh, Somehow I blundered quite uh, early on and I lost in about 20 moves. So I think he'd only actually used about five or six minutes on the game. So it was a bit unfortunate that of the 26 minutes that he'd used, 20 of them were being late for the game. Uh, so I, I think I always remember that as, as someone who was, I think, just you know incredibly talented to be able to play at that speed. I don't think you see many people playing at that speed. And as well, I would say also... Vasily Ivanchuk, just some positions, he could see the right move with such speed and such clarity that you would be at a top tournament and just he would come up with a move so fast in an analysis room or something and everyone would be impressed. You know, just all the other players were like, how did that happen (laughs) so quickly? And I would say probably Magnus Carlsen, I think, because he has such a complete style uh, and he's so strong in both positional play and tactical play. And he can sort of switch when he plays a match, he can switch his approach from one to the other. But against Caruana, he was looking to make things a bit sharper and more tactical. And then the most recent match, uh, Nepo Niachi, he was playing much more solidly and giving giving much 
much less away with black, going to e5 instead of Sicilians and things like that. So I, I would I would name three there, perhaps in in terms of uh, talent. And when you when you see these guys uh, at an early age, do you just immediately go to like they're going to be world championships or world world champions or world champion contenders at some point? Or yeah, I think. I think with those, it was very clear. I mean, with Vichy, he was showing up and he was just winning all the ECF squad events, which was very unusual for someone from India to come over. I mean, there weren't many strong players from India at that time, but to come over and just be crushing everyone, that was that was quite surprising. And obviously with Ivanchuk, his talent was very obvious quite early on. Well, certainly by the time he was playing international events and I came across him, you know, everyone was... Uh, and, you know, people would also talk. They'd say, oh, this guy Ivanchuk, you know, if you hadn't played him before, it was already, he was kind of talked about in in order, odd, term, odd tones. And, well, Carlson, you probably know a bit more about as you probably saw right. his, his ascent uh, more in real time. Yeah, I mean, all three, uh, all three get mentioned frequently when I ask these kind of questions. I mean, just uh, absolute legends. And, of course, speaking of legends, Mickey, you've, you've, gotten to play some of the great sort of spanning the generations. Um, you know, you played Mikhail Tal twice, uh, David Bronstein, Spassky, Korchnoi, and then obviously we move it forward to the, the modern legends. Um, do you have any, like, do any of those names cause a particular imprint from your early encounters with them? Well, I think I was very lucky to have played uh, the uh, the players that you mentioned that I got to play when I was young and I mean, people like Spassky, Olf Anderson, Bent Larson, you know, just to play so many of those legendary uh, players. Yeah, certainly to play with them and to be sort of around them at a few tournaments, certainly to be at a couple of tournaments with Tal was just absolutely fascinating. And to see him after he finishes games, he would always just sort of go to the analysis room and play Blitz and drink. And the thing, it was just uh, that was certainly their very treasured memories. Uh, and to have played with Spassky a few times, who's was a really incredibly nice guy. Uh, and, you know, guys like Olf Anderson also, I thought that was very interesting to have played quite a few games with uh, Olf Anderson mm-hmm. and uh, to be a bit friendly mm-hmm. with him. You know, he I hung out with him after the game sometimes and had drinks and stuff. So I, I think they were, uh, you know, I think I was quite lucky there because a few a few years later, those those players probably wouldn't have been around and people who came along leaving a little bit later wouldn't have got the opportunity to, to play with them or uh, or to uh, you know encounter them at tournaments or hang out with them a bit so that was that was certainly special memories for me and of course when you're young it can be not it can be hard to necessarily appreciate opportunities like that like with something like tall holding holding court you know in the skittles room was that something that that grabbed you i mean obviously he's a f- former world champion so were you just pulling up a chair and watching or was it just something you kind of took note of um well i think they i think a lot of those people had a real presence of their own uh and tall it wouldn't really only be I mean, just all the players in the tournament would often be there uh, right. hanging out with him. And one time, I, mean, I got to play with him uh, at the tournament uh, in Buenos Aires that was sponsored by uh, Miguel Nidoff. So he was also there hanging around at the tournament the whole time. I mean, as well as it was his company who was sponsoring it as well. Uh, and you would have little touches that sometimes a player would get up from the board and Nidoff would just uh, sit in their chair for a bit and things like that So mm-hmm. uh, during the games. Uh, so there they were – but I think they all had – you know, Spassky was another guy who had – you know, you could probably tell from footage you, you've seen of him, you know, he was very friendly and very funny and uh, just uh, – they, they sort of a lot of them, uh, they, uh, they would sort of – Dominate. They wouldn't exactly dominate a room. I don't, that's not the right way to put it. But uh, they had such presence. Everyone was really appreciative to uh, listen to them and uh, hear their opinions and uh, uh, that kind of thing. I, I can only imagine. And and we had a question uh, from Patreon sub Alex Friedman asking, um, of all your victories against other super GMs, which one is your favorite? Yeah, that was a tricky question because there's sort of so many games. In the end, I wrote down a couple. 
a game that I won actually quite a long time ago against Ivanchuk in 1991 in a tournament uh, in Terrassa, Spain, uh, near to Barcelona, uh, which was in the martial attack, which I quite liked. There was a kind of, kind of almost a kind of zugzwang, despite there being a lot of pieces on the board at some moment. Uh, and I'm still quite fond of that game, uh, even many years later. And then I wrote down uh, one other against Topolov in uh, Vikanze in 2006, which was a nice, nice win. Had a lot of good games with Topolov, actually. I mean, quite a few nice wins, which I'm very happy with, but it, he also won a lot of nice games against me. It was a, that, that was quite a good, that was another good stylistic matchup, I think, for interesting games uh, for uh, spectators. But that game in Vike, it was uh, a night off and, and I, I won quite a, quite a nice uh, game, sort of blend of tactics and strategy. Uh, so that was another game that I was quite happy with. It's actually on the uh, best of British chessable uh, product that some people may have seen. So people may may uh, see that game there if they've got the uh, the that per, that. This product. is the uh, the top of love game. Yeah. So uh, so I just mentioned those two. I mean, I could list sort of huge number of uh, huge number of games, but uh, I don't know. Those were those were two that came to mind uh, today. Yeah, when I was thinking about it. Yeah, and I and the Ivanchuk game is in one of the books co-authored with your dad with with your notes. Uh, uh, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and uh, that book, um, and those books are, are they hold up well? I have to say, Mickey, there's there's some fun stories in them that <laughs> that I'd like to ask you about. So we'll start with the the relatively <laughs> innocuous, which is, uh, you know, your dad mentions that you played um, you played Kasparov twice in simuls in in your teens, and in in the first encounter, he he describes uh, you ended up taking like a, a sounded like a limousine ride with him. Um, to to get to and from the venue. So I mean, I'm just imagining a 13 year old having that kind of experience. What what are your memories of that, Mickey? Yeah, I don't remember that so well actually. Um, but I think Gary is always the same, full of energy and variations. And uh, I think it may have been after the game. And I think then he was talking. There was one game he was particular. I think it was a kind of sharp Kings Indian that he'd won, and he was that game had really got his uh, attention. I think. I think we had a relatively short draw in that simul. Um, the, the, certainly the sharp games in that simul had really got his attention. Actually, I think I played him three times in simuls, and I had uh, one that I won, one I lost, and one draw. Um, but no, it was very impressive, uh, a very strong opposition that he played in, in all the, uh, the simuls, uh, particularly the one he beat in, because I think then he was taking on a lot of English juniors and a lot of them were very strong and it was quite a lot of them uh, as well. Uh, and he did, he did lose some games, but I was very impressed by how he made such a big score in that event. But he was quite, yeah. he was very practical though. I mean, at some moment, I remember at some point moment in the civil, he agreed like, I don't know, four games drawn on one circuit and then just <laughs> focused on the other, on the others. He, he obviously knew, uh, He'd obviously put quite a lot of thought in how to how to do simuls. Always used to doing simuls with very strong opposition, and uh, knew knew all the ways to uh, m- maximise his chances to score uh, in terms of knowing when to eliminate games and uh, focus on the others and things like that. That's funny. Well, I mean, in in OTB chess, as in as in simuls, it's in you know the practical side is important in terms of uh, maximising y- your results. Um, Another story that I enjoyed was, you know, uh, Grandmaster Vladimir Kramnik, of course, who's been on the podcast and has spoken about uh, his sort of um, wilder, younger years. You mentioned a tournament in Greece in 1992 where uh, he and his brother drank a, drank a lot of vodka and then there were chairs in, uh, in a pool in the morning. Chairs like the pool chairs had ended up in the pool. Does this ring a bell, Mickey? Yeah, that was a, that was a very good, that was a very funny tournament. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was when sort of Kramnik was very much on the way up and perhaps wasn't so well known, but he, I mean, he won the tournament so, uh, so easily there. I and mean, he just won, uh, he won quite a few games, few draws. He was undefeated. It was obvious. Uh, he was on a, a different level, 
but uh, his his brother had come along who I, well, I didn't really know to know that well I don't think he spoke so much English he was quite a lot smaller than Vladimir but uh, Vladimir said no no my brother is a much bigger drinker than uh, me <laughs> but uh, yeah that was it was in a very nice place we were just by poolside and they were giving out drinks all the time they just I think it was sort of the end of the holiday season and I guess they'd had a pretty good holiday season and made their money for the year and uh, this chess tournament was just sort of tacked on at the end before they closed up for a winter and went off on their holidays so everyone was in a a good mood and uh, yeah I was having a a very good uh, a very good time there as well so I don't think there was a no one seemed uh, too unhappy about anything we got up to anyway so uh, it, it was a it was a fun tournament that's fun yeah and as you mentioned Kramnik only 18 years of age and just coming off of that I believe I believe it was right shortly after that breakout Olympiad performance is that, is that yeah right? I think it should be the same year but I think you're probably right it should have been later yeah it should have been just afterwards so perhaps perhaps you're right perhaps he had perhaps after the Olympiad uh, it was no great surprise but it, I think this the performance that he had in the tournament was still uh, still pretty impressive. He was he was still gaining elo at a, a very fast rate at that time. Yeah, and which which game it was escapes me, but I seem to recall you showing one of your games from from that tournament as well. There was one win that you found particularly um, memorable or instructive. Um, I don't know. I think I might have annotated a game with Lotia, perhaps. Um, I think if I'm thinking of the right tournament I might have won a game against Lotier there I did I think I had quite I had quite an interesting game with Kramnik I think we made a draw I played the Benko it was quite uh, quite sharp back in the days when I played the Benko but uh, uh, which was actually probably not a bad result uh, but I'm not absolutely sure which which game. Okay, I, I might I might try to double check that if I have a moment. But but speaking of of Lottier, that was another memorable story <laughs> where um, you it's mentioned in the book that he was. Uh, and again, this stuff is all in print, so I'm not trying. I'm trying, I'm not trying to, <laughs> to make anyone look bad, but it's already out there. So I just would like to to hear a little more color about it, which is like that when he was winning games. You or your dad wrote that he would screw the moves into the board, and one of your grand, one of the, your grandmaster colleagues didn't really appreciate uh, this, so they they put a price on his head of uh, two beers if uh, if you could beat him. Yeah, no, I had to I had to get a winning position and then and then start screwing the pieces in. That was the point to kind of right. slightly return the uh, favor because he'd had a bit of a trying loss to <laughs> Lotier in one of the earlier rounds. But uh, well, anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know if I was going to do it anyway. But uh, in the end, actually, he just sort of resigned when I was thinking about whether the position <laughs> was now sufficiently safe. I could start uh, showboating a bit. So so nothing actually really. Uh, really uh, came of it but yeah he he did have a a tendency to do that i mean we always got on quite well and uh, he's a very nice guy but yeah some at one time he did he did uh, he did do this i mean of course it, uh, it it does can have a certain psychological effect and maybe isn't uh, can be used as a bit as a weapon but uh, it's perhaps not the uh, not the friendliest thing to do when you're winning so uh, right. you, you strike me as pretty sportsman like it's uh, even even if it's a act of reciprocation or to to please a friend it's hard for me to imagine you you <laughs> have, having done that if if he hadn't resigned yeah no i don't know whether it would really have uh, really have happened but uh, yeah i do remember that uh, i remember that tournament quite well yeah <laughs> <laughs> must be uh, so many so many memories i can't imagine um and obviously again you've got some funny stories in here so i'm just curious uh mickey if if who comes to mind if i ask you what grandmaster has has made you laugh the most made me laugh the most hmm. i don't know that's very uh very hard to say i i don't think i wouldn't say any grandmasters are, are necessarily particularly funny but sometimes they do some things which can be <laughs> can be uh, particularly uh, particularly amusing um so uh, i would think it's more incidents that uh, okay are, yeah are funny than particularly uh, uh sometimes they're just uh, norm- normally when they're somewhat out of when they're just sort of in their own little world and slightly out of touch with reality i think uh, or thinking about something else that can be uh, that can be quite amusing yeah common trait and do any particular in- incidents come to mind mickey um i don't know well it's always very hard to kind of come up with a a story uh, exactly um 
I remember uh, one time when I, quite a long time ago, actually, when I was just starting off in chess, I, I was playing the World Team Championship uh, in Lucerne. And at that time, we, it was just when computers had just started off, but no one really had computers. But you could sort of print out games. Uh, so you would have these big printouts of all the, your opponents in a in a tournament. So we had all these printers, and it sort of came in this big white paper with perforated edges. So anyway, and I was playing this tournament. And Julian Hodg- it was so I was playing for England in, in the world team, and Julian Hodgson was also on the team. And so we sort of came to the end of uh, the event, um, and uh, we sort of had all these printouts, and we were a bit sort of fed up with all these printouts. We were not really a much grateful for all these advances in technology, which meant that uh, preparation was harder work. So for some reason, and this admittedly wasn't great behavior, we kind of put this printout out the window and clamped it <laughs> shut. So it wasn't actually, we weren't actually littering, but it just sort of went out the window. And anyway, we sort of, went, then we had some more drinks. We sort of forgot about it and I went to bed. So then, uh, anyway, the next day I'm sort of, so it's leaving day and, you know, I was sort of, uh, you know, dozing happily, sleeping off these uh, drinks from the night before. And there was a sort of banging on the door very early and I was sort of trying to ignore it, you know, thinking, oh, they'll go away. But anyway, this banging is very uh, persistent on the door. So eventually I was sort of thinking, well, I'm going to have to get up and answer it. So I'll go and answer it. And then sort of Vasily Ivanchuk's standing there. He's holding this big sheaf of paper and, uh, and at that time, I don't think his English was particularly great at that time, or perhaps uh, perhaps his English teacher hadn't sort of uh, given him the uh, the language. Perhaps it wasn't a common phrase. I've just detached this printout from your window, uh, <laughs> committed all the games to memory, and uh, I'm now returning them. Uh, so he sort of just sort of wordlessly handed them out, and I sort of took them, and he de- he departed. So I, I was sort of hoping that he might have sort of added a few novelties in, or some sort right. of compensation for the fact that Word provided him with all these uh, all these games. But he, he didn't seem to have annotated them. I guess he saved the novelties for himself. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah, and yeah, probably took one, as you say, glance at them and memorized them all, <laughs> knowing uh, with with his reputation. Well, it was quite early in the morning, so I don't know what time he got up. So I think he was knocking on the door, sort of around seven thirty or something. So I'm not sure what time he got up to have uh, to have uh, gone through all these games. But uh, do you think he was uh, burning the midnight oil? Or? <laughs> I yeah, I don't know. It is possible he could have got them. I suppose yes, late at late at night. <laughs> <laughs> very funny. Um, okay, well. Mike, Michael, we're going to take one more break, and then uh, I want to get into your your fantastic new book and to into uh, some chess improvement talk. Listeners, I just got an update from aimchess.com, and unfortunately, I'm still behind on the clock 72% of the time. Working to get better, progress is not just a straight line upward, but I am getting better in the other aspects of your game, which Aim Chess can measure, which are openings, tactics, endings, advantage, capitalization, and resourcefulness. And of course, Aim Chess automatically gathers your games from the major chess playing sites to give you actionable insights and even quiz you on tactics that you may have missed during your game. So please go to aimchess.com and check out the product. And if you do decide to subscribe, use the promo code perpetual30 to get a discount on aimchess.com. And we are back. And Mickey, I did want to talk about your new book, uh, Think Like a Super GM, which I have read and actually, as I mentioned to you in email, done the exercises. Obviously, sometimes for interviews, I just kind of read the pros. But this book, I was so grabbed by the style of it that I I wanted to complete it properly. Um, and I, I think it's fantastic. But before before we dig deeper into it, could you give a little overview of its sort of unique approach? Yeah, well, it's good to hear that because, I mean, you're not the only person who's also, well, normally I don't end up doing all the exercises, but I have done with this book. So hopefully that's the style where it is a bit more engaging in terms of the way uh, it's presented. Um, well, it's really, it was really sort of Phil's book originally and his idea that he, he came to me with um, to uh, be a part of, but uh, the project sort of developed so much and uh, grew and uh, changed over time that I think in the end that uh, I've ended up writing quite a lot of the content and doing quite a lot of the editing, but he did a huge amount of uh, collecting the uh, data and coming up with the idea and setting up the eye tracking experiment 
Um, but the the idea really was based on uh, the experiments that they did at the uh, Avro, famous Avro tournament, where they recorded the thoughts of very strong players, in particular world champions, Alakine, Erva, and so on, and some other quite strong players. And so we've sort of updated or feel or had the idea to update and expand that experiment. I mean, in the case of, of my book, we go from very strong GMs down to, uh, you know, fairly, uh, fairly low rated club players and Phil recorded their uh, solutions as they were giving them in a way. It's a bit like sort of a little bit like the master game in written form. Uh, so it sort of says after second, after a certain number of seconds, the player says white as the bishop pair or, or whatever, and then they start mentioning the moves that they're looking at. So their their entire process as they think about deciding which move is best in the test position. And they were also asked to give an assessment of the position after they gave their move to compare about against uh, Stockfish's assessment. Um, as another bit of data. And then Phil has looked at a huge, at that in a kind of a, a data driven way and divided players into groups of roughly 200 rating points and found some very interesting correlations there. Um, I've written up the solutions in considerable detail uh, to. I've tried to extend the variations quite a bit, mention a lot of the uh, possible moves in the position. Uh, there's quite a lot. I've tried to do it with quite a lot of words as well. There are a lot of variations in the book as well, but I hope a lot of a lot of uh, kind of general written advice that might be uh, interesting to read. Um, so I don't know if that's an overview. And as I mentioned, the uh, final chapter we actually solve puzzle positions whilst tracking the eye movements of the position. So you are sort of zero in your eyes on the board so they can see when you're looking at A1 or H8 or whichever square, and then put the puzzle position up on the computer and see where your eyes go, which was, I think was also, that was a very fun thing to do. I really enjoyed that. That was actually my idea to do that uh, bit, but Phil was able to set it up with his uh, connections in that in the academic world. Um, so that's also something which I think is pretty unusual in a book. So the whole, the whole book is, is quite unusual. I think also the assessment bit is, is quite an unusual thing that you isn't mentioned very much in a lot of books. Um, so I don't know if that's a reasonable overview. I always find it quite hard to explain the book. Uh, yeah, no, it is a, a reasonable overview. Um, I mean, I, I would mention that it follows in the footsteps of the famous De Groot book, uh, Thought and Thought and Choice in Chess, and yeah, it's um, it's a great window into how different players think. And it, it, as you say, it's a nice combination of the exercises are instructive, seeing how the seeing how players like yourself, um, and Grandmaster Julia Granda Zuniga and others think about positions is also quite instructive. Um, but then I also really enjoy the conclusions um, at the end of the book where. You guys, uh, both you and Phil, sort of um, write about what struck you in terms of how grandmasters approach thinking about a position compared to how players across the different levels. Now, I don't know how much, Mickey, we want to give away as opposed to have people um, find out when they buy, buy the book. But, but what could you say generally about what, what you noticed as you looked at how different players of different levels approached these positions? Yeah, well, that was sort of a bit. I mean, originally, really, I was well, to solve the the puzzles for the, the data for the book, and to sort of do light annotations of the puzzle positions. And those puzzle the annotation, I think, grew to a, a considerable size. And I kind of had a kind of a takeaway tips to each position as well. But the conclusion chapter, I think, was also something that I wasn't really originally intending to write. But it's actually quite a big chapter in the end. Um, there were lots of different things. I suppose the most surprising bit for me was how often people would know a sort of general chess principle and it ended up causing them problems because they would 
say, oh, okay, if I do that, I give up the bishop pair. And so instantly they would cut that variation dead and, and stop looking at it. Um, but the, you know, if they had looked a little further and it wouldn't need to necessarily, it would often wasn't very complicated if you looked a little bit further to say, oh, I lose the bishop pair, but actually there's a big positive to that. So it's a good idea. That I suppose that was one of the uh, conclusions that uh, I was, I think I was surprised in end games, how difficult people found end games as well. Uh, in general, there's some more specific stuff in the book, but perhaps I won't give away too many, uh, too many details. And I think also perhaps how people's assessments can go haywire, that if you give them a position and say, what's the assessment, they do quite well. But as they go down a variation, their assessments seem to diverge quite wildly from what might start off as quite as an accurate assessment. I mean, really, what I think what you need really in every position and what the tr- stronger players tended to supply was an accurate variation, which might only be, I don't know, three half moves or something like that, and an accurate assessment. And if you had that, you were pretty good. And even when stronger players got a puzzle wrong, they would still supply that. They'd just have missed the opening move. Uh, so that was basically their the way that they operated. But uh, with the lower rated players, they didn't really do that in terms of investigating uh, the move they had in front of them enough. And that tended to lead to problems with the evaluation, uh, if nothing else. Yeah, that was one of Phil's conclusions as well. I, I guess we aren't giving too much away to say that he was struck by the calculation ability and how concrete you and the other top players were in terms of assessing positions. Yeah, I mean, we actually wrote our conclusions completely separately. So we didn't, we actually came to a, some of the same same or very similar conclusions independently. He didn't, you know, we weren't we weren't combining on those two chapters. He wrote his and I wrote mine. So it was... Uh, that they were they were arrived at independently yeah and and again i i did did the test ass, assessed my score and everything and i scored around 2200 which is you know in the ballpark of my rating so it it seemed accurate with that uh n of 1 one other conclusion that i had that that wasn't mentioned but i i generally shared your guys's observations was at least from my perspective um at my level solving it there, there was one issue is I would just miss moves more than you guys. And it might be on the first move or it might be on the third move, but it was often a case where um, I saw most of the things, but there was just one move that entirely escaped my attention. Yeah, in general, stronger players do go a little bit deeper. Uh, and sometimes they, they like to, I think, get to the end of a line and go, okay, now I know the conclusion. I know this line's reliable. I know the, the end of that line. And then they'll tend to go for that line because they know where they stand with it. Uh, whereas sometimes there might be a more complicated line, but then they're less likely to go for that because they're not quite sure about it. They can't, they can't know where they're going to end up. So I think that's, that's another thing which they tend to go for. And in some positions, that was the case that they would kind of settle for a move that uh, they were sure about rather than one which is very, very complicated and uh, they, they were a bit more suspicious of. Yeah, and I liked, obviously, Phil has a bit of a scientific background as an engineer, and uh, he he mentioned, um, he called his one of his conclusions the art of falsifying, and mentioned uh, exactly what you're talking about, like this this ability to, to try, when you're a strong player, to try to disprove why your hypothesis, uh, your hypothetical move might not work. Yeah, I think that that was clearly one of the big the big takeaways as well. That when the strong players have found their move, then they're like, okay, but what's the response to that move? And uh, they want to know the best response before they're uh, convinced that that that's the correct move. Uh, or even if they do know that it's the correct move, that they're, they're immediately then moving on to what the correct spon- response is. Whereas some of the other solvers, they just find the move and then. They don't really think too much about happen what happens next. Or they'll say, oh, there's this move and that's threatening that. And they don't stop to think how the opponent can meet the threat. Yeah. So 
again, just in, in summation, it's a fantastic book. And, you you know, um, Phil and yourself are getting the perspective of players rated from 1,000 to yourself, obviously, 2,700. And I've already gotten a couple emails, Mickey. Sometimes I do podcasts about books. And usually it's not something 100% contemporary. Usually it's something that's um, at least five years old. Um, but I've already gotten a couple of messages saying you, you've got to cover this book. So I don't know how it's selling. And I know uh, Mark Crowther of uh, The Week in Chess uh, was on Twitter talking about how, how much he enjoyed the book. So I think those who've already checked it out are greatly enjoying it. And I'm, I'm going to write a review of it as well. And uh, I definitely strongly recommend it um, for, I mean, players of all levels, but especially I think from intermediate on up, from say fifteen, sixteen hundred feet a on on up, I think it's it's a fantastic resource, and there's tons of original ideas and original approaches of uh, to to chess improvement. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really I did want to try and make it a book as much as possible for a range of players and not only for strong players. So sometimes, actually, when I see chess books these days, I'm like, this stuff is so complicated and. Uh, is so it's quite useful to me as a, a pretty strong player. And then you're thinking, but can this really be that accessible as you go a bit further down the rating system? So I, I, I'm glad that you're uh, that you feel that it, it, it succeeded in that aim. We have had some quite nice feedback from some people. Some of it very encouraging, but I guess it's only it's only been out a few weeks, so I, I've no idea how it's going in terms of uh, sales or uh, anything like that. Yeah, and here in the U.S., I think it's probably still hard to get a paper copy. I, I got it on Forward Chess when it came out, which is always yeah. a, a, a good way to consume the book. But I, I know a lot of people like to wait for the, the paper version. Yeah, I think it came out perhaps a week earlier on Forward Chess. So, yeah, some of the people who have who have read it might well have got it through there, yeah. Yeah, and, and we had a related question, Mickey, from a uh, supporter of the podcast, Wayne Inkpen, who asks, uh, will you be producing a collection of your best games or a collection of games that provide your best chess instruction, something like the Judith Polgar set? Yeah, so the first two books that I did were, were more kind of games and career. Admittedly, they only went up to a relatively small portion of my career. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely open to doing another kind of book like that someday. I think it would be nice to see how this book goes and if it does go well uh, and it's encourage and the sales are encouraging, that might encourage me to write a bit more. I mean, when I actually did my first two books, uh, unfortunately, the publishers uh, ran into a difficulty. Uh, that was sort of Robert Maxwell Companies, who was the father of Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, when he... Uh, died there were huge financial black holes in his companies so i never really even know how many copies those books sold or what the royalties well i didn't get any royalties but i think those books could have done a lot better so that was a bit of a downer in some ways that uh, the way that uh, i didn't feel that those books uh, i think that put me off writing books for a while in a way that uh, i never really knew how it came out so i think i might do another book and of my games but i don't know whether I think a lot of people like a book they can engage with now, that they can solve puzzles or they feel it's something they can do things with. I mean, if people do like this book, I did wonder whether I might do something where I would do some of my games, but there might be a puzzle from my game that, that uh, people could solve. And then there'd be the annotated game, but I would go into particular detail on the moment of the puzzle and uh, write more, perhaps a little bit in the way that I wrote up the solutions to the puzzles in this book, but uh, that will depend a little bit, I guess, how this book's received. But uh, perhaps sounds like a chessable course to me, Mickey. <laughs> um, maybe I, I don't know. I don't know if that would uh, work. Maybe, maybe that could be a, another uh, possibility. That was a question about books, wasn't it? But uh, y- yes, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, a chessable book course is something that I, I would probably like to do at some stage as as well. But I'm not sure if many people have done a kind of best games thing on chess and ball have they and i think that's quite unusual so far yeah i i tend to agree just so, thinking off the top of my head a few have been adapted like i know uh your compatriot simon williams is working on adapting the life and games of uh mikhail tall but but in terms of like a top player like yourself i mean magnus i guess uh his courses are are in that style um right. but anyway what, whatever format it be whether book or um or chessable course, I think uh, people would be excited. But I understand with books, I, I get what you're saying about uh, 
Yeah, this book, the, the, sorry, yeah, this book took a long time. I uh, did. I think with the co-author, it always takes longer anyway. Uh, and it just took a really long time to come out. I mean, it's really nice just to see it in print now and to know that it's out and that people are buying it and, and enjoying it. So that's, uh, and certainly if it does, if it does so well, I think that's very likely to motivate me to do more in the future. Okay, there you have it, listeners. Um, and and I do recommend, again, that uh, I think you can buy Mickey's and his dad's old books used. I, I think they're out of print. So unfortunately, Mickey wouldn't see any uh, revenue from that. But, but I, I strongly recommend them if you're just looking for a compilation of both stories and uh, annotated games. They're, they hold up quite well as well. Yeah, it's not. It's not only sort of. I think it's not so much the royalties. I mean, it's not a big deal. I mean, these things happen in life that sometimes. Uh, uh, but I think that more of them could have sold. Also, that's the other thing that. Yeah. Many many people have actually spoken to me about those books, and not, you know, people still be, speak to me about them now. Also, I know that you were researching for the interview, and that's probably part of the reason that you came off across them. But people still do talk to me about those books at tournaments quite regularly now uh, and i think that you know that more of them could have come out and they could have continued to uh, to have sold for quite a long period so i think it was just a bit unfortunate how that that happened uh, uh you know when uh, at that time yeah and the, and the books by the way are called uh, development of a grandmaster which is about mickey's teen years and uh chess in the fast and actually preceding his teen years as well and uh chess in the fast lane which is more as mickey ascends to being a top player and I'll, I'll put the links for the books in the, in the show description. Um, so we've got another question to get to uh, from Shubham Kumtakar. And Shubham's question is, as someone who largely trained on his own during your development, developmental years, which self-training techniques did you find most beneficial? Uh, and then he's got a follow-on, but let's start with that one. Um, I think if you're on your own, well, I think you should play a lot because... Uh... I certainly played a lot. That was definitely a big way that, that I learned. Um, and I did study my own games, I think, or, or particularly key moments from a game. There'd be moments in a game that I thought were important that, that, uh, that I needed to try and understand and to work on. And that would be a big focus for me. Um, because I think, I think if you're, I think if you're on your own a lot, then it's definitely important to play a lot because then that's that's your source of feedback. If you've got a coach, then they're providing feedback. But uh, if you're not really working with someone else, then I think that playing is when you, you get a lot of feedback and you learn what's working and what isn't. Uh, and I suppose, uh, you know, sometimes analysing with players. I think also I, I would, you know, often hang out with other players at tournaments and sometimes I picked up different ideas from people then. I mean, I probably played quite a lot of weekend tournaments with guys like uh, Mark Hebden and Keith Arkell, and they were always very generous with, you know, sharing comments and thoughts, not only if you had played them, but, you know, just in general, they were often quite happy to, to hang out and discuss things about chess. So I think things like that were quite useful to me. Yeah, yeah. it sounds in, in your dad's writing, like Mark Hebden, it was kind of like, it was like a level in a video game that you had to pass. He kept beating you um, in, in your early games. Yeah, we had a very funny sequence of results because he abs was absolutely crushing me. Uh, he won countless games. I think I maybe made one draw or something. And then I had a very long period where I just started winning against him. And I was also making just a huge score of, of terms of you know, I think I might have even equalized the score or caught up or something. And then actually in our more recent games, he scored quite well. Uh, huh. So it's just a very funny sequence that whenever, when someone started doing well, then it seemed to, the sequence seemed to continue. We haven't actually, we'd actually play so much these days, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, a, it was quite an unusual sequence of, uh, of games where he was just sort of totally dominant and winning every game. And then suddenly when I started to, break that break my duck and started winning then I, then I suddenly started, won a lot of games in in a row but of course we would play a lot because we were both playing all the time and we right. probably play every weekend tournament so the, the score could move quite quickly because you know we might be playing you know several games a year uh, and they're probably rapid play games as well that uh, haven't uh, haven't survived in terms of uh, 
you know, if you look on the database, it's a, a fraction of the games we actually played. Yeah, and and to to Shubham's question about uh, how to improve in, in terms of self training, that is one thing that really struck me from rereading these books is just how constantly you were playing and uh, how much travel was involved. I mean, since you didn't grow up in in a city center and this was pre internet, I mean, it just seems like your your childhood was spent like on trains and planes and <laughs> in between chess venues. Once your chess career took hold. Yeah, well, it's just the the way the way it was then. But yeah, there was quite a lot of traveling, and uh, yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes my family had to come with me when I was younger to the British Championship and stuff. We had holidays at the British Championship quite a lot of years and things like that. So yeah, that was a uh, nice of them to. Uh, I'm not sure they were always the, exactly where they would have taken their holidays otherwise. Right. Yeah. Very 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 kind of them, and great that that your dad took the time to chronicle those years. And uh, Ali Mordazavi, he told some funny stories of like his parents just basically setting him off to sea to play in various tournaments, uh, not necessarily always accompanying him in his teen years. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Ali's a great character. Uh, yes. One of my. Uh, Memories of Ali was some sort of, I think we were part of a, some kind of England junior team at the uh, British Lightning Championship, and somehow uh, my dad was, had somehow become sort of manager of this team. And uh, I think managing Ali was a, a bit of a challenge. He still recalls uh, <laughs> fondly, <laughs> as I think you could probably imagine. Uh, yeah, this interview. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, listeners who who have not heard Ali's interview, just tuning in for for Grandmaster Adams, I definitely definitely recommend you guys check it out. It's uh it's amusing. Um, so follow on question from Shubham is uh, having played the British Championships, the Isle of Man International, the Gibraltar Masters regularly, and as an as an American, I'll throw in the World Open and the Chicago Open as well. Yeah. Um, but Shub- Shubham asks, he says, you seem to have played more Swiss tournaments than other elite players and have done so with success. What do you think are successful strategies in terms of openings, mindset, et cetera, to win such events? Um, well, I suppose I always play quite a lot anyway. I mean, I played weekend tournaments in the UK for quite a long time, even when I was quite high rating and playing a lot of international events. And I've always played team competitions uh, throughout Europe. So I suppose I'm quite used to playing players of, of different ratings. Um I don't think I have a particular strategy. I think you slightly adjust your strategy depending upon the strength of your opponent. Uh, but I think I play in a pretty similar way anyway. I don't think I have a particularly uh, different strategy in Swiss events. Uh, but, you know, you just like to... you. I think you look to change openings a bit. I'm, I'm not someone who looks to make things super sharp necessarily early in, in the game. But normally, if you're looking to win games, I, I I try and look for systems where it's likely to be a long game. There's going to be play in the position for a long time, where maybe there won't be a lot of exchanges, and there'll be perhaps opportunities to outplay your opponent over a long period of time. Not necessarily that you're looking to try and make the game sharp and win it very quickly, but just to get some position where the game will continue and things will happen and uh, you hope to uh, you hope to to win later playing a lot of weekend tournaments in the UK it taught me that you could win games that your opponents could play very well for a long time even if they're actually quite a lot weaker some of the people that I would play but they would very rarely play well for the entire game they normally had some weak moment at some stage and even when you're playing more competitive opponents in open tournaments that are a bit weaker they normally they normally do have a moment where they lose the plot if the game goes on long enough. Very often you will get an opportunity, but it, you don't necessarily want to try and force that opportunity. You just want to try and keep things going and keep the game go, going without make, taking huge risks or committing, over committing. For me, at least, I mean, it depends on your style. If you asked you know, a very sharp player, they would probably have a completely different approach and go, okay, I just look to try and blow them away quickly in a sharp position. But I think you just have to stay true to your own principles and adapt them a bit to the to the mixed level of opposition you get in open tournaments. Yeah, that that advice definitely resonates with with me. Again, more more at more at the club level, I feel like, and it's been a sort of topic of conversation how the competition is stronger than ever. Someone rated, you know, 
1800 or 2100, whatever it may be now, feels a lot stronger than someone with the same rating 20 years ago. But you you do still notice that people will give you a chance sooner or later. Uh, sooner or later, they will make a mistake if if you can avoid making one, which is, of course, easier said than done. Um, so we've got a couple more questions, Mickey, if you're okay. Um, are, sure. you, are you good to answer a few more? Absolutely, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. This has been been amazing. So this is uh, from Patreon supporter Igor Feinstein, who asks, uh, and he's got a few questions as well, so we'll take them one at a time. But number one, who do you think will win the candidates tournament? Yeah, that's a, that's a, quite an interesting question. Well, I actually looked up the uh, odds when you, you sent me this question, because I hadn't actually looked too much. Uh, and there was one bookmaker, and they basically quoted... Caruana, Ferruja, well, they didn't have actually have Ding's name up, but they had it had him up as any other player, which I think <laughs> in this case stood represented Ding Liren. And they had them pretty much as joint favourites a long way ahead of the, the field. Uh, I think they and but some of the other odds were quite interesting. I mean they had Nakamura at twelve to one, uh Nepomniachi at sixteen to one. Duda at twenty to one, Rapport at twenty-five to one, and uh, Rajabov at thirty-three to one. So uh, some pretty uh, some pretty long odds there. I mean, I guess I guess you can certainly make a case that when you have those three players, it's kind of hard to imagine someone else playing. I mean, Duda is a player. I mean, if a, if if someone said to me have a have a long odds bet, I would certainly think that that could be a quite a good value bet. I mean, he showed a very good temperament in the World Cup. Uh, he's a young guy, so no one knows quite if he might be ready to make a huge leap forward. And he's already a very, very strong player, just based on the results he's already shown. So I don't know. I'll, I'll be very interested to see how he goes. I would find it very hard to pick one of the three favourites. There's so much uncertainty at the moment, uh, it's a bit hard to say with Ferruja's. It seems to have been preparing for a long time and not been playing very much. I don't know. That would seem a slightly unusual approach to me for a young player, but maybe it will just work out great for him. And it's also a bit hard to know. He's obviously proven to be incredibly effective against lower rated or somewhat lower rated opposition, whether the stronger opposition in the candidates will slow him down a bit or not is another uncertainty. I mean, I would say Carawan has won the uh, candidates before. He's got world championship match experience. Uh, I think perhaps I might go with him of the three favourites if I was going to pick one of them, but it's just really completely random. Ding yeah. Liren obviously hasn't been playing too much until he's suddenly become uh, the most active player in the world for a month. <laughs> so again, it's a bit hard to uh, to know exactly where uh, where he's going to be. So... Uh, I think you know it's no no one really knows. I'm not normally very good with predictions anyway, but uh, there are, there are some thoughts in answer to that question. Yeah, well, the the modesty is generally the the mark of a good predictor, and I'm also impressed with your sort of uh, handicappers um, a perspective. You know, I did a candidates preview with uh, with your friend Daniel King a while back, and obviously he's uh, you know has tons of uh, domain knowledge, knows all the players inside and out. But when it came to the odds, he was like, oh, you know, I can't think about, I can't, my, my, my brain doesn't work that way. I can't think about percentages. Oh, whereas yeah. it's, whereas yeah, with it's you, you're going straight to the percentages, uh, identifying Duda as a potential value bet. Um, do you have experience in that domain? Um, yeah, I've not played him, uh, played him very, uh, very much. I played him in some online games, but uh, just I've been quite impressed watching his his games. Yeah, the World uh, Cup was something. Yeah, was and just just his temperament at the World Cup, and you know he's very young. He's got no stamina issues, uh, and you know I think he's a very confident player. I could see him. He's got good at opening preparation in general. I'm sure he'll have been doing a lot of work for the candidate. So, you know, it's just, to, again, it's important. It's quite hard to know how people will do until they play in the candidates and experience can be quite important, but it's also, I mean, also the candidates tournament, it depends a lot how you start. Yeah. And, 
you know, if uh, there will certainly be some action players there, I think this time, you know, someone like Rajabov, for instance, who, who will probably play very, very solidly. If he comes up against people who decide to target him and try and beat him, you never know what can happen that, you know, that might might play into, into his hands, for instance. So it, they're all very strong players. And uh, certainly to, when you look at the disparity in some of the odds, you're like, can that, does that really reflect, uh, you know, their respective playing strengths? Uh, you know, it's not that long ago that Rajabov was also winning the uh, World Cup. Yeah, with with all the draws recently, I feel like he's he's definitely he's definitely out of favor. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand why people are frustrated by his draws, but uh, you know, if you when he has to play, he's quite capable of doing it. Uh, and you know, some sometimes in the candidates, there will be some people who will, in that field, I think who who will look to uh, make things happen uh, in their games. So, yeah. Uh, Grishuk seems, seems to take that approach. Not that he'll be in this one, but um, and so, someone like Nakamura, you know, given his his station in life, his success uh, away from the board, it seems like he he might take a maximalist approach. Um, um, I don't know because I think he's also a guy with very solid openings uh, in general with Black, and he'll probably stick to his repertoire he knows very well and try and be pretty solid. But yeah, with White, yeah, it's hard to know what approach he might take with White. He might be more uh, more open. Uh, then so and also so also the other thing is if some of these guys have a bad start they're they're not going to shut down i think they're just going to start trying to get back into it and open up i mean if you know if nakamura loses games earlier on i don't see him just drifting along i'm sure he'll start playing uh, aggressively to try and get back so that will create interest uh, as well yeah were you, were you su- surprised by his success in in the qualifiers yeah, totally. I have to say. I mean, if you had asked me beforehand, I would have predicted that he was really going to struggle in, in the classical games. Uh, I think it's a really, really impressive achievement, actually. Uh, I, Yeah, I mean, I don't see how you could possibly have predicted that he would play that well uh, in the classical games, just uh, without any current practice. He really just, you know, hit the ground running and just all the games were very impressive. Yeah. Uh, I don't It'll think, ma- fun. I don't think many people truthfully really predicted it, even if they somehow think they predicted it after it happened. Right. Yeah. It's one thing to say you're not surprised. It's another thing to have expected it. Um, you know, I, I, in hindsight, I'm not surprised, but certainly uh, it could, I would have said the same thing if it went the other way and he just didn't have a great score, but uh, you know, and then went back to, uh, his streaming uh, dominance. Um, yeah, so- I think it's also a question of rust for me. I just thought he would be rusty. I just thought he would. It would take him several games to get back to his level because, for me, I found that very much that I just feel still feel um rusty. And he hadn't really played classical for such a long time that uh, you know if you're playing 15 minutes is the longest you ever have on your clock. It's quite a different thing. Yeah, it's true. Um, and, and Igor also also asked if if you think of any of the players in the candidates have a realistic chance of beating Magnus in the World Championship. Um, well, yeah, I think so because when someone wins the candidates, even if it's a surprise winner, then they immediately grow in stature. Uh, and uh, obviously, Caruana has already had a very close uh, match with uh, Magnus. You know, if Ferruja wins the candidates, well, that would already seem like a pretty dangerous opponent for Magnus. Ding Liren is another player who clearly a pretty strong player has Magnus's respect. And you know, if one of the other one of the other players uh, does come through and there's a surprise winner, then we will be looking on them, in, you know, in a very different way. In the same way that I was just saying, you know, we I didn't predict uh, Hikaru's success in the Grand Prix. Uh, if someone has success in the candidates, well, that that uh, is is unexpected, then that will uh, change uh, perspectives of a of a match. I mean, of course, you know, no one's going to be in a hurry to bet it against Magnus in, in a World Championship match, uh, uh, and it, he'll be favourite. But uh, you know, he's not going to be a prohibitive favourite. Uh, whoever plays him will certainly have uh, a certain certain chances. 
Yeah. And and uh, Igor's last question, which I would be asking anyway, is how, how seriously do you think, do you take Magnus's statement that he wouldn't play anyone other than Ali Reza in the World Championship? Um, well, I don't really know. I mean, only really Magnus can answer that question. I thought it was a little bit strange that he kind of said it in advance. I mean, I thought he might uh, have waited more until he knows the opponent and then dealt with the situation then to some extent, because it's sort of a little bit strange. But uh, I would be surprised if that's the only opponent that he, he would play the match against. But uh, who knows? It's just really impossible for me to uh, for me to say on on that one. I mean, in general, Magnus doesn't say things unless he means them. So I think it should certainly be taken seriously to some extent, but uh, I don't think it's impossible that he might uh, see another opponent that uh, he thinks uh, could be interesting and change his mind. And maybe he might change his mind, whoever the opponent is. I, I don't know. But uh, it's a very difficult one to answer. I mean, I have quite a bit of sympathy with him, actually, in terms of the way that we talk about the World Championship, when, you know, there are three World Championships, and the Rapid and Blitz, to me, are quite fascinating events. Uh, But because of the way that they're organized in this kind of desperate rush, uh, (laughs) you know, after Christmas, over five days, and then you have these quite unsatisfactory tie breaks and so on, uh, sort of diminishes them. I mean, for me, I, I would think a good way for chess. I mean, obviously, if you were kind of looking at how to promote chess or how to organize events, you wouldn't really start with the uh, current uh, chaos. And uh, But I mean, to me, I would be thinking that you might look to more have, I don't know, perhaps four world championship events over two years, perhaps two a year. You would still have a the classical world championship match but you would also have a a final event for the world blitz uh and i think that would also conclude in a one-on-one match just like in the world championship there are obviously lots of different formats you could have I and mean, you might have quite a few people at the the final bit of the world blitz because you'd obviously be able to you know have a qualifying section and and the final match within a, a period and the same for world rapid and perhaps perhaps also have the world World Cup as as a one off event rather than a qualifying event, uh, so that you have a world 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 cup champion or a kind of combined discipline champion. And there might also be room. Well, I'd like to think there would also be room for some kind of uh, Fisher Random uh, event. But I think if you perhaps had had it a bit like that, so that uh, you had the four events and there was a, a final one on one match to decide all of them uh, in a you know non random way. That perhaps the uh, the kind of slight obsession, which I think Magnus doesn't like so much, with the World Championship match as it's sort of the be all and end all, and diminishes the events that I think he quite enjoys playing in the World Rap- Rapid and Blitz and the somewhat rap- random format of a fifteen round Swiss, uh, or well, it's longer in the Blitz, but even so, it's quite a short period of time. Of course, you'll then have to you would have to make the qualifying for these events much shorter uh, and possibly you might in some cases end up with some players seeded through to the final events in some cases, depending on the numbers. But uh, I think that would be a much better way of doing it, particularly now that we have so many people who have come into chess during the pandemic. They've perhaps watched a lot of Twitch streams. They've played almost exclusively online at Swift time controls that perhaps are a very interesting world blitz championship maybe over 10 days two weeks or whatever seeing uh, guys like Hikaru that they watch a lot I think that could really uh, that could really connect with them in a way that perhaps watching the world championship with these long games lots of opening theory perhaps it doesn't and I I absolutely think the World Championship match, classical matches are important and interesting. And I would certainly like to see them continue. And even if Magnus does decide he doesn't want to play, then I certainly would hope that, that, that you know, whoever does, you know, want to play will uh, continue and matches will continue to take place. But I, I do think that, uh, that that would make chess 
that would, would give you much more marketable events. It would be more interesting for sponsors, and it would perhaps, uh, it perhaps, and you would also perhaps have a kind of grand slam. So as, you know, Magnus could try and hold to try and hold all four titles at the same time in a kind of way that they do that they have it perhaps in tennis. So, I mean, okay, there are lots of other ideas, but and I'm sure other people would think of different ideas. But I think that there, there, uh, I think if you looked at the current system. And then you wrote down your ideal system on a blank bit of paper that you wouldn't see a huge amount of overlap at the moment. And uh, that's perhaps something that chess needs to think about rather than just kind of continually tweaking the, our current system uh, as we go I, along. I love it, Mickey. I, I, I couldn't agree more from my humble opinion. And, you know, obviously, from a selfish perspective, I really want to see Magnus defend his title just because it's entertaining, but I certainly wouldn't mind if he utilizes his station in the chess world to sort of push things in that direction because he's been outspoken about uh, some of these ideas for, for a decade now. So it would be great to see. Uh, yeah, I, the, I love the World Blitz idea in particular. I think it would be very popular with a lot of players. I think most of the top players would be quite happy with it. And I think for, for all players, I think, uh, and I think it's also just to kind of increase the importance. We now have, you know, rapid and blitz racing lists, but it, it, they're still sort of considered like a, a somewhat less important form of the game, which I think is a pity. And of course, the World Championship has been, Glasgow World Championship has been decided quite recently in rapid games, uh, uh, you know, a few times anyway. Uh, we haven't actually seen it go to blitz yet, but that's also a, a possibility that could could happen in the future. So I, I think that's uh, something that would be interesting, and uh, I certainly think I would like to see. Uh, even if I'm a, even if I'm only a spectator, I think that would be a very interesting <laughs> part. But uh, I hope, uh, who knows? Perhaps I might get to take part in one of those events before I finish up. Yeah, how, how is your blitz game? Um, well, my blitz rating isn't too bad. Uh, um, I mean, I can't really play online, but in person, um, you know, I think it's very streaky for me, blitz. If I get on a good streak, things can go quite well. I had quite a good result in uh, the Beal tournament where I played. They, they had a day of blitz and I scored quite well in that. Uh, so that was quite a good result. But some, some of my other tournaments haven't been... Uh, as successful, but I don't play that many games to really, uh, really gauge things. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but you're not, you're not playing much online or are you just weaker when you play online? Yeah. I'm just not very effective online. My mesh skills are, are non-existent. So I don't <laughs> really play very much. I've occasionally played, but only really because I, just to get some practice because I haven't played for so long or because I had another online event coming up and just to sort of try and get warmed up a bit. Okay. I don't play much in general. Uh, I stopped playing online quite a long time ago in general, actually, and I haven't really gone back to it since then. Okay. And and you mentioned you've got a few tournaments coming up, um, but we also talked about your uh, affinity or willingness to play in these big open tournaments. So do you have any of those circled on your calendar tentatively? Um, not particularly, but I, you know, I'm sort of okay for the next few months. I've got my plans in place for, uh, for those, uh, those months. Uh, they're, they're also, I mean, the Bundesliga season has become quite compressed this year. Um, so there are still a couple more weekends and, and a final group of games in those upcoming uh, I don't know how many of those I'll be playing, but I think some of them. So I'll actually be getting in plenty of of games. So perhaps when I've sort of, if I haven't any, got anything else in my schedule when I come to the end of that, I might uh, look to uh, see uh, see what what open tournaments uh, might be uh, available. But it would depend a bit how things go as well. If uh, if uh, if the tournaments go well, perhaps I might be more looking for uh, for action. Okay, well, we would look forward to it, Mickey. I just thought of one or two more questions that, that I wanted to ask you. Num number one, this is one of those, like, I couldn't find the source of the quote, but I'm pretty sure you said it. You said, it might have been in the, the new in chess, just checking questionnaire, but you said, true or false, you said your greatest achievement in chess is uh, never having gotten a real job. Uh, yeah, well, that was mainly a joke, but uh, yeah, I think it was in the new in chess. So. Okay. But, uh, I've, been, I've been asked to do a sort of few of those things over the years, and you try and come up with something slightly uh, 
uh, original and uh, amusing or not the not the same answer as you gave last time. Right. Um, yeah, no, I think I would find it quite hard to have an also office job. I did do two weeks work experience in a bank once, but uh, oh wow, it seemed to be it seemed to be very long hours actually. Uh, actually, working kind of nine to five. Yeah, it's quite yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so, that that didn't really appeal. That was when I was very young. So uh, after that, okay. after that, I think the the uh, life of a chess professional seemed a lot more appealing. <laughs> so did you did you quit the job? Did you get no, no, fired? It was, what it happened? was like two weeks work experience. It was not. It wasn't intended oh, to like be. An internship. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah it was just. They were doing something. I think it was sc- through school actually that they was that you know everyone was supposed to do this, and you know I, well I don't think I absolutely had to do it because I probably already had other plans. But okay, I, actually it was it was interesting to do it in a way anyway because uh, yeah that was the only real experience I had of, uh, of any kind of uh, actual work. <laughs> And and I I hope the answer to this is no, but obviously uh, a a strong chess player, even even someone world class like yourself, their income can be uneven. So were there ever moments, Mickey, where you thought you might have to, I mean, a get a job, but probably more realistically, just do more chess stuff, you know, do more in educational stuff and simuls and stuff like that. Um, well, things weren't too bad um, in general. And I was sort of making money from a fairly young age uh, because I sort of turned professional quite early on. And I was kind of fairly aware that at some stage, if you're a chess player, that your income will drop. So I was fairly cautious. So I don't think I was super concerned about that. So I was sort of, sort of fairly cautious in my spending and to kind of build up a bit of a financial buffer in case uh, my career did hit the rails. So that wasn't something that I've been as concerned about um but yeah i did think i did think that i would have to make other plans much earlier on but as my playing level was sort of carried on being quite high um that hasn't been as big a problem i'm not i've never been making huge uh, sums but i've always been making enough to be sort of fine so it hasn't it's been it's been okay. I, I never had really huge years except for when I was playing the fee day knockouts and there was quite big money and I was getting to the later stages. But I was always sort of doing okay. I mean, probably, I suppose, during the pandemic, uh, then things could have been quite tricky. But then I did quite a lot of other uh, activities in terms of lectures and teaching and stuff like that. Um, so... It hasn't really been a, a big problem from my point of view, but I've normally had a pretty respectable world ranking most of that time. So good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And and Mickey on your blog, which listeners should definitely uh, check out, and um, you, you of course write about think like a super grandmaster on there as well. But you you mention a few times, you know, uh, about ten years ago having having a condo in Florida. Do you do you still spend some time in Florida? Uh, well, we've sold the condo quite a few years ago now, um, and we haven't actually been back since. I mean, that was very nice. We really liked it there in the uh, Florida Keys. That was very nice to go there because it was always warm, and that was just great to get away from winters. Uh, and we normally got out a couple of times a year. Uh, it was very enjoyable having it. But uh, the problem was then that we didn't really go anywhere else because <laughs> – Finding the time to go there, and obviously it's quite a long way to go. You need a certain amount of time to get over the flights and, and stuff like that. Uh, so that was part of the reason that we sold it. It was also it was a condo, and the uh, most everyone in the building was very nice to us. But there was a, a, a quite a large amount of internal condo wars going on within the <laughs> building, uh-huh. and uh, the, these uh, these were always slightly. Uh, they always made you slightly nervous. And I think that that, uh, that was sort of why uh, part of the reason as well that we were quite happy in the end to uh, put it back on the market and let someone else enjoy it. But no, I'd definitely like to go back there and indeed to come to America again. Who knows, perhaps for uh, perhaps for a chess event. I've never been to St. Louis, so, for instance. So, oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that we'll be looking to do that. But obviously, it's been... Uh, it's sort of impossible to travel anywhere recently. Um, but no, I think we'll certainly will go back and visit again, but uh, just uh, renting someone else's condo rather than staying uh, staying in our own uh, 
if we uh, if we uh, go back. No, it was it was a great experience having it, and uh, we enjoyed it. For, I think we had it about seven years, uh, but uh, happy to move on and did, done some different uh, tourism. We did a Nile cruise recently, which was really good, and we were in South oh, Africa wow. and different places. And there are still some other parts of the world that we'd like to get to. Uh, uh, as well on on our on our list of travel and uh, there are always always better to tick places off as early as possible i think in terms of travel because uh, so uh, that's uh, certainly other different tourist places on our wish list so that that was part of the re- the reason that was the main reason i think that we sold it really that makes sense and what's your favorite chess venue of all time i mean i can only imagine how many you've you've been to <laughs> I mean, again, it's just very hard to say. Uh, I suppose a memorable one that was great fun just when I was starting off was when I played the World Junior in uh, uh, in Australia right at the start. And I went with David Norwood, which was already a lot of fun. We were sharing a room in some school dormitory, and that was uh, that was also a fun fun time. But it was quite a strong event. It already Ivanchuk was playing. I played with Ivanchuk there, and uh, Loti actually won that tournament. Uh, at, uh, yeah, lots of other Copian and uh, Galfand, lots of other uh, strong players uh, taking uh, taking part. Um, so that was sort of a memorable one-off one. I would say Vikanze is a place. There's a very special atmosphere there, and I played. Well, I'm not quite sure how many times I played, but it was. I was well into double figures. I think it might have been 13, or maybe maybe even more. I'm not never very good with the statistical side. And because it's quite a long event, I mean, they tend to play it over three weekends. So it's really quite a, a long time to play there. And fortunately, most of the time when I played, I was doing pretty well and I had good results because it's quite a long tournament. If you're not doing very well, I think if you're uh, struggling a bit, that that's quite a quite a long time to be at a tournament. You don't have many tournaments, 13 rounds. And I think they have three, four free days. So it's quite a quite a long time it's i mean it's still very old style in fact by can because most other tournaments they've you know they've tended to eliminate rest days or keep them to a minimum now uh but i certainly had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fun times there and uh, lots of uh, good friends uh guys like jan timon uh, ivan sokolov your own piquette before he re- before he retired uh so uh and lots of people uh Lots of the organisers and people like that. I know uh, your own Vandenberg and people. So a really very nice tournament and they really go out of uh, their way to uh, look after the players there. I mean, in the, in the Netherlands in general, they have a lot of, uh, lot of respect for players and in fact, tournaments wherever I played, not, not only there. But uh, I think that's a tournament that I've got particularly fond memories of that I played so many times and the first it was one of the earlier tournaments that I played I played uh, in uh, Groningen and Vikanze both one year in fact I think uh, John Fedorovitz was playing that that first year that I played so that probably gives you an idea that it's going back a few years uh-huh. uh, so yeah it, it, it was uh, I would say that's a that's a perhaps a, a, a traditional tournament that I really appreciated yeah timeless yeah such a rich tra- tradition um, well, Mickey, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Um, really appreciate it. Is, is there anything you, you wanted to mention before we say goodbye? Um, no, I think we've had a pretty good chat. I mean, as, as I mentioned beforehand, I've actually listened to your, uh, podcast quite a lot because I saw, uh, I actually came across it as a tweet from Simon Williams when he came on your podcast the first time. And oh, wow. Old days. That, and I think that was... I'm not sure which number it was, but I think it was in the first five. I think it might even yeah, I think be it was number third. five. If I'm right. yeah. yeah, so so I've actually listened to uh, quite a lot of them. I haven't listened to absolutely all of them, or some of them I've listened to bits and not all of them. But uh, I've certainly enjoyed it very much as a listener. So thank you very much for providing uh, a great resource for uh, for chess players. Uh, and I think also being a bit of a trailblazer because now that, I mean, I have to admit that I've only recently become aware of how many other chess podcasts there are now, but, uh, you know, I think you very much led the way and I think inspired a lot of, uh, a lot of the other ones that have uh, come along afterwards, which I, I've also enjoyed listening to, uh, several of, uh, several of those. 
Well, thank you, Mickey. I'm I'm truly honored and and honored as well to to get to talk to you. Um, just uh, you know, I I knew you'd have amazing stories and perspective and chess tips, and it, it did not disappoint. So, uh, listeners, if you want to support what Mickey's doing and enjoy a fantastic book, the book is called Think Like a GM. Um, I'm also going to write a review of it on the, my Lee Chess and Chess.com blog. So, listeners, this will be out. That'll be out when this podcast comes out. Um, so, yeah, just thanks again for all of your contributions and uh, good luck in in Sweden and the Olympiad and and everything else coming up this year, Mickey. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.